As we've progressed throughout the book of 1 Samuel, we've seen that first, Israel rejected God as her rightful king. Uh, She demanded a human king so that they could be like the surrounding nations. And God graciously yielded to their demands, but promised them it would be a bumpy ride. You know, the kings of Israel, they were intended to act as God's representatives. They were to rule under his authority and in reflection of the reality that God is the only true king. But that's not what happened. Starting with the very first king, Saul, we see that these men often acted in their own self-interest and for their own purposes. But God, he had a redemptive plan. One day, he would send his son into the world to take on human form. And he would be born in the line of King David. And once again, God's people would submit to God's rule. So, so much as the kings of Israel reflect God's reign, they prefigure the coming of God's son. But in their deviance, they offer a distorted image. And that's where our title comes from, Distorted Kings. And so far in the story, we've seen an increasingly distorted image of Saul contrasted with a relatively clear picture of David. So last week, Shannon, he compared Saul to a laggy and corrupted TV image whose signal has gotten so bad that the feed, you finally just have to cut it off. You you can't really see anything. (laughs) There's no point in even trying to watch what it's supposed to be showing. So at this point, nothing in Saul's reign is king. It points, nothing in it points to Christ anymore. And so it's David's turn to rule. But as we've seen, David's image was also far from perfect. Two weeks ago, I preached this on a series of bad decisions by David. Um, he continually failed to consult the Lord. And as he did that, he led others into his sin with him. And ultimately, he backed himself into an impossible corner. You know, David, he had been living in enemy, enemy territory for over a year. And he did that because he doubted that God would protect him from Saul. He's like, Saul's trying to kill me. I really don't think God's got my back. So let me take matters into my own hands to ensure my safety. And while he's there, he concocts these devious, murderous, and deceptive plans, um, and he endears himself to the Philistine king, Achish. And Achish is so fully bought into David and his lies that he asks him to march into battle with him against the army of Israel. So David had told him, hey, I've been raiding my own people, I've been raiding Judah, and Achish believes him, but in reality, David was raiding other people, like the Amalekites, which will be relevant in today's story. And so Achish thinks David is on his side. Achish thinks David is against Israel. And so he asks him to go and fight against Israel, to go and fight against Saul. And David agrees. And that's where the story ends. It ends kind of on this cliffhanger. And we're left to wonder, what is going to happen to David? Is he really going to betray Israel? Like so far in 1 Samuel, he's been this great figure. And even when he has opportunities to kill Saul, who wants him dead, he expresses faith. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. Far be it from me to lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. But here we see him marching into battle to go and fight against Saul. So has David had a change in heart, of heart? Is he starting to stumble as well? And if he doesn't intend to betray Saul, right, if him going into battle is just part of his further deception of Achish, which I'm inclined to think, how is he going to get out of this situation? Because he, at some point they're going to realize that he's not there to fight against Saul. <laughs> and Saul wants him dead, and the armies of Israel want him dead, And when the Philistines find out that he's actually lying and betraying them, they're going to want him dead. So David's going to find himself in this situation where he's surrounded by multiple armies that all want him dead. (laughs) And so like, what on earth is he going to do? How is he going to get out of that? And will he finally turn to the Lord? Because up to this point, he's gotten himself in this situation and he hasn't been seeking the Lord's wisdom at all. So that's where we're picking up today. And as the story ended there, the narrator quickly took a step back and looked into the world of Saul for for a time. And that's what last week's sermon was about. And in doing so, we saw that Saul, too, was also in this impossible situation. He was on the brink of death, and there was a promise of judgment from the Lord, the judgment of this coming battle. So Saul, he's somehow in an even worse position of David. So normally we see Saul and David contrasted as like, one's not really following God, and one is, and Saul's in a sucky situation, and David's kind of glorifying God and in, in a good situation. But They're kind of both in these really terrible situations right now. And you're like, okay, who is actually glorifying the Lord right now? Um, So we're going to pick up David's story again today. Um, So I'll go ahead and pray, and then we can find out how the plot resolves. God, um, yeah, I just pray that you would fill me with your spirit today. 
pray that you would strengthen me. Um, I've been physically weak the past, the past week, but God, it's just been a good reminder that my strength is found in you and not in myself. Uh, it's such a privilege to, to preach your word, and I uh, yeah, just ask that you, you would be glorified today. pray these things in your name. Amen. All right. So to kick things off, I actually want to show a map. So we're, we're in chapter 29 in verse 1. I don't know. Okay, yes, we have it. it Graphic-wise, I guess it, the scale didn't appropriately transfer, but I can, I can kind of explain. So down there, the orange route, where it says like Amalek in the bottom of the territories, that's where David in chapter 27 was carrying out these raids against other people. And he was telling Achish, like, actually, I'm attacking Israel, but he's not. He's attacking enemies of Israel. And then David is kind of home-based in Ziklag. Um, he's kind of hiding out there from Saul, and it's a place that Achish has granted David that you can stay there as a place of refuge. And then Achish, he's the king of Gath. So that's kind of up there from the green line, goes from Ziklag to Gath. And so Achish asks David to come join him in battle, so he marches up from Ziklag to Gath, and then they're together marching up from Gath, and you can't really see it on the screen anymore, but there's this place called Aphek, right? And so chapter 29, verse 1 says, the Philistines gathered all their forces at Aphek, and Israel camped by the spring in Jezreel. And so about 40 miles north of Aphek is, is Jezreel. And so Jezreel and Aphek, they're really strategic places for Israel to be gathering and for uh, the armies of Philistia to be gathering as well. So it says the Philistine forces are now at Aphek. Um, and Aphek, it's a strategic place for the Philistines to gather before advancing farther north because it was basically this military stronghold, and it was a trade center of great commercial importance. So you have all these multiple armies spread out, and they're all kind of meeting up at the spot, the strategic point, before they're going to go and try to conquer Israel. And then David, right, he's with them. He's um, it, advancing up to Aphek with um, Achish. And then Saul, on the other hand, with the army of Israel, they're camped out um, in Jezreel, um, and Jezreel is pretty close to this other city called Endor, which is um, where last week's sermon took place, and it's also a Star Wars planet. And so since I'm preaching today, I do get to mention that just for, just for fun reasons. But um, Jezreel and Endor are right next to each other, and Jezreel is a very strategic uh, spot for Israel to post up camp as well because it had a ready supply of water and food. It was this rich valley. And they assumed, right, that the Philistines are going to gather at Aphek and try to take control of the valley of Jezreel because it was such a vital segment for trade as well, and it was this route that connected Egypt and Mesopotamia. So that's probably more detail than you want to know, <laughs> but the reason I kind of show this map and share, share these facts is because sometimes when we read the story and we see the tension in and the cliffhangers, we can just be kind of awestruck by the literary beauty of it, and um, we can miss sight of the fact that these are historical events. These are real realities. These are real people and real places. Like, this actually happened, and this is how God was working in, in Israel. So, you know, I want us to think about the distance between Aphek and Jezreel. It's about, like, 40 miles. So it's kind of like the same distance between Ann Arbor and Detroit, for example. So imagine, you know, we're one army gathering, and, and then we have a partner church um, in Detroit called Restore, and so maybe there's another army gathering at Restore. And you can kind of think of these things, but, you know, this is... These are real events, and, and these are really significant in leading up ultimately to the coming of Jesus. Anyway, as we move on, right, we see not only um, is this Philistine army massive, um, but it's also very well organized. And so the last week's passage, it portrayed Saul as terrified. <laughs> and it's really no wonder that he was terrified when you consider how many Philistines there were and how well organized they were. So verse 2, it says, As the Philistine rulers marched with their units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were marching at the rear with Achish. The commanders of the Philistines asked, What about these Hebrews? And Achish replied, Is this not David, who was an officer of Saul, king of Israel? He has already been with me for over a year, and from that day he left Saul until now, I have found no fault with him. But the Philistine commanders were angry with Achish, and they said, Send the man back, that he may return to the place you assigned him. He must not go with us into battle, or he will turn against us during the fighting. How better could he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men? Isn't this the David they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. I want to pause here because I find this conversation personally a little humorous, right? The Philistine generals, 
they are rightly concerned that David and his men are going into battle with them. So they ask Achish, like, what the heck is going on? Why, why are these Hebrews marching into battle with us when we're going to fight against the Hebrews? And, you know, Achish, he, rather than, I guess, realizing how stupid this idea is, he responds with this almost gleeful pride. He's like, is this not David? Like, look, I have enlisted a famous warrior to fight for us. You should thank me for this incredible recruit. Achish, he's completely oblivious. And the Philistine commanders, they're kind of like, yeah, no doy, it's David. That's why we don't want him going into battle with us. Don't you realize he's literally killed thousands of our own people? Why on earth would we recruit him? And so they kind of have this spat, and Achish uh, relents, not because he sees the wisdom of it, but because he just all his officers are kind of against him, so he kind of accommodates to them. And so we see in verse 6, So Achish called David and said to him, As surely as the Lord lives, you have been reliable, and I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until today, I have found no fault in you, but the rulers don't approve of you. Now turn back and go in peace. Do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers. So Achish, he reluctantly obliges his commanders. But at the same time, he wants to assure David how highly he thinks of him even as he sends him home. So to communicate his steam for David, he invokes the name of the Lord. And, and when in the Bible you see the Lord in all caps, it's actually invoking the name Yahweh. It's just done out of respect because we don't actually know how to pronounce it. Yahweh is just our best guess. And so he's invoking the name of Israel's God intentionally. This isn't some random Lord. This is Yahweh. Um, and so he invokes the name of the Lord. And I want us to realize, pause for a moment, and realize how strange it is that Achish appeals to Yahweh. You know, he is a pagan ruler, and he is going into battle against the Lord's chosen people. And all throughout these two chapters, chapter 27 and chapter 29, David never once consults the Lord. David never once mentions the Lord. How is it that the first and only time Yahweh is appealed to in these two chapters is on the lips of one who does not worship him? You know, you would have expected a Philistine ruler to proclaim, as surely as Dagon lives, because that was the primary deity of the Philistines. But no, he gives honor to the Lord. You know, in those days, it was common to believe that each people or land had their own gods. And to win in a battle, it usually means that your god was stronger than the gods of the people that you had conquered. But what we believe and what Israel believed is that Yahweh was not merely one god out of many. He doesn't simply rule over one people group or one plot of land. Rather, he is the God of the entire world. He is the creator, and all things live and move and have their being in him. And even as we have been focusing specifically on the nation of Israel and God's role as Israel's true king, we have to recognize what it meant for Israel to be elected as the people of God. And so to do this, we have to go back a little bit uh, to Genesis 12. And this is when God calls Abraham to establish the nation of Israel. So 12, 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham, right, he was blessed to be a blessing. And calling Israel to be his people, God was giving them a priestly vocation. He wants them to display his glory to the surrounding nations. <laughs> it wasn't because Israel was better or more special than all the surrounding nations. It's because God is glorious and he wanted to use a people to show his glory to the rest of the world. And he makes this point even more clearly to Moses. In Exodus 19, he says, after, after he gives them the Torah, uh, the commands, and he establishes this covenant with the nation of Israel, he says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So what we see is that Israel has been specially called to be God's representatives to the surrounding nations, to spread the light of his truth to every nation dark corner of the world. But rather than influencing the world on Yahweh's behalf, they were influenced by the world. They rejected God as their king, and they wanted a king like everyone else. So, as we've been saying, God planned to use a king to lead Israel in blessing the world. 
And when Jesus came on the scene as the ultimate fulfillment of that promised king, his kingdom rule indeed began in Israel. But now it is spreading to the whole world as he gathers people from every tongue, tribe, and nation to himself. When we talk about this mandate to spread the gospel to the whole world, we call it the Great Commission, and that's at the end of the book of Matthew. But it did not begin in Matthew, as we can see here today. It's God's heart has always been for the whole world. And so David, while he's been living as an exile in Philistine territory, he, he could have been spreading the good news of Yahweh during his time there. But instead, what does he do? He, he chooses to exploit, deceive, and plunder. And I think it's unlikely that Achish is appealing to Yahweh because he has learned from David what it means to worship the one true God. You know, rather, it seems that Achish is merely giving a special courtesy to David by appealing to the God that he knew David worshipped. So while David has yet to consult God in this story, we find that even the non-believer he has been deceiving is willing to give Yahweh some kind of recognition. That's pretty convicting to me. You know, if you think about it, we too are exiles in a strange land. But do we reflect Christ any better than those around us who don't know him, who don't worship him in our culture? You know, I, as many of you know, I used to live in South Asia. And while I was there, I had a lot of friends from different religious backgrounds, particularly from, from Hindu backgrounds. And um, they sometimes displayed just a surprising faith in the power of my prayers. They had something going on. They'd come to me and I'd offer to pray for them in the name of Jesus. And, you know, I get wrapped up in my thoughts. I'm like, oh God, I hope you answer this prayer. And then they can see how good and how glorious you are. But they sometimes had more confidence that Jesus was going to show up than I did. <laughs> and, and that was very humbling for me. I learned a lot from that, from, from the sincere desire to see God in, in the hearts of these people that didn't even worship him in the same way that I did. And so, as we look back, right, um, I think that there's a lesson for us here now. We, we have an opportunity to be God's representatives to those that don't know him. Um, and, and people are watching. They're, they're noticing how we, how we reflect God, and they, they know what we believe. And so we should be giving testimony to him, even in our difficult circumstances. Actually, in our difficult circumstances, that's often when our testimony is the greatest. So I really think David had a missed opportunity here with Achish. Now, to jump back into verse 7, you know, apparently Achish, he thinks that David was so eager to fight against Saul, he would stay and try to battle despite the wishes of the Philistines for him to go home. So he says, hey, go home in peace. Don't do anything to displease the Philistine ruler. It's like, just go home. And Achish, right, he thinks he's disappointing David and sending him away from the battle. But in reality, he has become God's instrument for delivering David from the lose-lose situation he has backed himself into. And I just want to say, praise God for his wonderful provision of a way out. But David, he, he doesn't just simply leave it at that. He, he keeps trying to, to force things. And so he says this to Achish in verse 8. But what have I done? Asked David. What have you found against your servant from the day I came to you until now? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my Lord and King? You know, if I was David, I would have been like, Whew, <laughs> I don't have to go anymore, but why is he trying to argue? Yeah, please let me fight. Like, what, what if he wins that argument? I'm like, dude, you just lost your opportunity to escape the situation. So I don't know what David's thinking here. Anyway, Achish answered, I know that you have been as pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders have said, he must not go up with us into battle. Now get up early, along with your master servants who have come with you, and leave in the morning as soon as it is light. So David and his men got up early in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So David's question here, hey, what have I done? The irony of it is that he has done much wrong, and he knows it. Right? And so I think maybe he's asking this question because he's fishing for information. He wants to find out whether or not his deception has been exposed, and that's why he's being sent home. He needs to know whether or not he can for sure continue to use Ziklag as a place of refuge, or whether he has to flee from the Philistines now as well. So David, right, he acts shocked that he won't be able to go into battle to fight against the enemies of his lord, the king. And I love actually this statement here, um, why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? Because it's delightfully ambiguous. Like surely Achish, right, assumed that David was referring to fighting the Israelites on behalf of Achish. But we as the reader, we're left to wonder, 
Is David actually referring to fighting the Philistines on behalf of Saul? Just like the Philistine generals were saying, hey, this is what David's going to (laughs) do. And so there's this double meaning inherent in David's statement. But that double meaning, it's completely lost once again on Achish. He has no idea that David might not be faithful to him. And ultimately, we will never know whether David intended to fight against Israel or for Israel because God, in his providence, he provided David a way of escape from that compromising situation. It never had to even come to that. And it's difficult to imagine this dilemma he found himself in resolving in a more favorable manner. Not only was he spared from going into battle against Israel, but he remained in the good graces of Achish. So God's providence, it's seen so clearly in this passage, but it's seen even more clearly. Because shortly after David becomes king over Judah, he has difficulty winning over the northern tribes that were loyal to Saul. So had he been associated with the death of Saul and Jonathan, had he actually gone into battle with the Philistines and fought against Israel, and that was how he got his kingship, he probably never would have been able to unite the monarchy. And because of that, he probably would have just continued Saul's legacy of a failed kingship. So again, we see God protecting David and preparing him to become king here. And so the point I want us to take away from this is that despite David's faithless decision-making, God remains sovereign, and God is the one who provides him a way of escape. This was no mere lucky break. (laughs) This wasn't an accident. God was in control. God was working behind the scenes the whole time. It was the hand of God upon the life of his anointed. And so likewise, no matter how difficult a situation we might find ourselves in, I want to say that there's never an excuse for sin. No situation is too impossible that God can't work in it. God is always working in our midst, and he's always ready to act on our behalf. And so this story reminds me of a passage from the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10. It says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So if we think about David, like surely he was one who was standing firm in faith, right? In chapter 26, he spared Saul's life, even though he had an opportunity to kill him. And so if there's anyone who we think like, oh, he won't fall. He's this hero of faith. He's got a great faith. It would be David. But even though he trusted God so many times, and he trusted God right before this story happens, he still doubted God in chapter 27, and he still gave in to sin. And that's what led to this terrible situation that we find today, where he was tempted to sin even further by fighting against Israel and against the Lord's people. But despite David's faithlessness, God was faithful, right? He provided a way out for David. And I want to say that he can likewise meet us in our greatest struggles, and he can provide us a way out as well. Do you ever feel like the cards are stacked against you so that it's Nearly impossible to do the right thing. There's nothing you can do (laughs) that it's going to work out well for you. I'm sure that's how David felt. He's like, well, if I don't fight against the Israelites, then the Philistines are going to kill me. And if I fight against them, then I'm betraying my people. And I'm sure David felt like he had no choice. But there's always a choice. God, God never wants us to go against his will. God never wants us to sin against him. And so what I want to suggest is that we can turn to God in our lowest moments. And I want us to think about what is it that keeps us from turning to God in those lowest moments of our lives, in those moments where we really can't see what he's doing or understand how he's going to resolve the situation. God, he always has a plan. And he's always working behind the scenes for our good and for his glory, even, what we, even when we can't see what he is doing. And so my encouragement today is for us to turn to God and to have faith, to trust him. Now, God providing a way out from temptation to sin. I I don't think it means that he will always rescue us from the earthly consequences of that sin. And unfortunately for David, the story does not conclude when he breaks rank to leave the battle. We see that he's rescued from the frying pan only to jump into the fire. So, picking up in, in chapter 30, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag, They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, 
Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail, the widow, widow of Nabal of Carmel. So, you know, David and his men, they return to Ziklag. And, and you can imagine the joy and relief they feel about not having to engage in this treasonous battle against their own people. But that joy would soon turn to mourning as they discovered that all of their possessions, along with all of their wives and children, had been looted by the Amalekites. I was reading one scholar who described this as the tragedy of Job multiplied 600 times over, right? Because there are 600 families here. You imagine losing everything you own, all of your loved ones, and having that happen to 600 families all at once. It's, it's terrible. And they just march some 50 odd miles. And then when they get there, they see what has happened and they weep until the point of exhaustion. They cry and they cry and they cry until they have no more tears left to cry. And who could blame them, right? They have no idea where their families are, and they were well aware of the kind of physical and sexual abuse captives of war often endured. And so it seems really that they had left one hopeless situation to return to something that was somehow even much worse. And I want to step back for a moment um, and to give a little bit of context about the history of the relationship between the Amalekites and the Israelites. Um, it's helpful to know that they have a long and bitter history. Um, going back to even the Exodus, when God rescues Israel out of slavery in Egypt, the Amalekites, they carry out this vicious and unprovoked attack on Israel. And because of this, all throughout the Bible, they're portrayed like these terrorists who, portray, who pray advantageously upon weaker or more vulnerable opponents. We see that in this story here, right? They attacked the city when there was no one left to guard it, when all the men were gone that could oppose them. And, and so this is kind of the character of the Malachites that we see often in this story, um, multiple stories in the Bible. And so is it any wonder that God in his justice calls upon Saul to wipe them out earlier in 1 Samuel? And sometimes those commands are difficult for us to wrestle with, but by failing to obey God here, Saul not only had the kingdom removed from him, but he also allowed the Amalekites to continue to perpetrate the kind of cruelty we see in today's passage. If Saul had been faithful to God, none of this would have happened. And as cruel as the Amalekites' actions are and were, their burning of the city, I want us to realize that it may very well have been a retaliation for David's previous raids on them in chapter 27. This attack probably wasn't unprovoked, actually. And while David left no survivors in his raids, lest they would tattle on him to Achish, the Amalekites, they actually haven't killed anyone here. And so it seems that they knew that David and his fighting men would be gone. And they planned their raids strategically at a time, right, when they wouldn't be opposed. And I think, again, that the sovereign hand of God can be seen in all of this. All of the family still remain alive, right? So there might be a chance for some potential rescue mission. And if David had not been sent home from war by the Philistine commanders, the chances are that they never would have been able to track down their families and never would have been able to find them in time. And so next week's story will flesh out exactly how that happens. But for now, I want us to just sit in their moment of grief. I, I want us to realize the depth of pain and despair that David and his men are feeling in this moment. You know, maybe you can relate to that pain. Maybe sometimes... It feels like you are just barely getting out of one terrible situation only to find yourself in a new one. You know, life, it can sometimes create a, a whiplash of terror, relief, joy, pain, sorrow. And eventually you find yourself weeping until you have no more tears to weep. You know, when we find ourselves in such situations, where can hope be found? Is there any hope? Is there any real encouragement to be had? And although up to this point... Right, David, he's been relying on his own strength. What we see here is that in this lowest of lows for him, he turns to the Lord and he finds strength and hope and encouragement in him. So yes, there is hope to be had. There is hope to be found in the Lord. So verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. So verse 6 says David is greatly distressed, right? All his family and his possessions, they've been taken from him. And now, on top of that, his most loyal friends, they want to kill him. Stoning him is where you basically take stones and you throw them at someone until they died. There's this mob. It's, it's, it's a terrible thing. And so David's most loyal, David's best friends want to kill him. And they, they do that because they blame him for what has happened. 
to their families. And deep down, if, if I was in David's shoes, I, I think he probably knew that they were right. I mean, did David really have to flee to the land of the Philistines? Did he really have to raid the Amalekites while he was there? And did he really have to march into battle against his own people, leaving their families home unprotected? You know, at any point in this story, he could have consulted the Lord and he could have realized the folly of his ways. But now, he's in a grave of his own making. And to be sure, the Amalekites, they are ultimately responsible for their own actions, for their own sins. But that doesn't mean David's poor leadership didn't contribute to the circumstances at hand. Clearly, his men blame him. And so for the first time, these fiercely loyal men, they question David's leadership. You know, they have been through hell with him for years now. They've been on the run with him, and they've faithfully stood by his side through thick and thin, multiple life-threatening circumstances. They have been faithful to David. But this, this was the last straw. So is it any wonder that David was greatly distressed? This truly is the lowest point of his entire life. And it must have been truly dreadful to feel not only his own personal sorrow, but also the overwhelming grief of knowing that you have caused immense pain to everyone you hold dear. Every single person you care about is in deep pain, and you are partially to blame. That's awful. <laughs> like, I can't imagine being in a situation like that. The things, they're truly bleak. But there is a real reason for hope. In this situation, David, he strengthens himself in the Lord. It says, but David. And if you are here two weeks ago, you realize that I started off my sermon pointing out chapter 27, 1. It says, but David thought to himself, one of these days it will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. And so that but David, it marked a contrast from David trusting in God and relying on God to rescue him to him trusting in his own strength and relying on himself to rescue him. So that was, that was a bad but David, right? But and then we see this story ends, and this is a good but David. It's David turning back to the God. It's, it's him trusting in God for his strength and for his safety. David, right, he does this, I think, because he can't rely on his own strength anymore. He has no more strength left to give. So where else can he turn? Finally, he turns to God in his deepest pit of despair. And sometimes, right, it isn't until we hit rock bottom that we finally look up to the Lord for strength. We finally realize that, like, oh, I should have been consulting God, you know. And my prayer is that, you know, those of us here today, we would seek the Lord long before it ever comes to that. But in the low moments of our life, I want us to think about where do we turn for strength? Where do we turn for encouragement? Do, do we seek it in the Lord? And I want us to realize today that God, he is an ever-present help in our time of trouble. He is in control. And even if you can't see it, he cares about whatever you are going through. And he's working behind the scenes in the midst of it. But how exactly do we turn to God in our time of need? Like, what does that look like? As modern believers, we can seek the face of God in prayer and, and his written word. And then we take appropriate action in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as God speaks to us. And I want to reflect on what does it mean to live by faith? What does it mean to find our strength in the Lord? And uh, I want to go back um, to verse 6 where it says, David found strength in the Lord. Um, some translations say David strengthened himself in the Lord. And they do that because the Hebrew verb here, it has a reflexive element. And what that means is he strengthened himself, right, as, as it says. And this is important, I think, because it's an expression of David's personal faith and his role in carrying out that faith. So God, right, he's ultimately the one who provides David's strength. But David is responsible to turn to the Lord and to find his strength in God. You know, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing to figure out what belongs to God and, and what is our responsibility when it comes to living by faith. And we see this tension all throughout Scripture, right? We're called to work out our salvation, but it's God who works in and through us, right? It says in Philippians 2, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So there's a role for us. But for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. And for those of us who follow Christ today, right, we, on top of that, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live the life of faith. And you have verses about, well, what does it mean to li live a spirit-filled life? And Ephesians 5 is one of those verses. It says, be very careful then how you live. Be filled with the Spirit. You know, be filled, that, that's a passive 
command. <laughs> That's a passive verb. So filling is something that happens to us. We don't fill ourselves. God fills us. But at the same time, we are commanded to be filled. We're commanded to let God do something to us. Like, how, how does this work? It, it can be a little confusing sometimes. Um, and so there's an analogy I, I like to give often, um, which illustrates this point. And it's the analogy of a sailboat. And so, you know, last week and last uh, the sermon I gave, I said the problem with what David was doing, it wasn't that he took action to preserve his life. I do not think that faith is antithetical to action, and that if you act, that that necessarily means you don't have faith. The problem was that he wasn't consulting God. God wasn't empowering and leading his action. So what does it mean to take steps of faith, to, to act in the power of God, to rely on his strength rather than your own? And so the analogy I like to often give of the spiritual life is one of a sailboat. And so um, you think of how a sailboat works, right? You, you have a sail and you put it up and you catch it in the wind and the wind is ultimately what powers the boat and helps to move it forward. And so there can be, I think, ten, tendency of two pitfalls in the Christian life where we can either try to find our strength in ourselves rather than the Lord, or we can be kind of passive and, and not really seek the Lord at all. I mean, like, well, God's got to move, but I don't really <laughs> have to do anything. I don't really have to trust him. God's just going to do it. And we just kind of sit back and and are just inactive and being tossed to and fro by the waves. <laughs> um, and so on the one hand, we don't want this passive independence where we're just saying, well, God's got it, and we're not actually acting in faith. We're just sitting there. Or but we also don't want this active like independence where we're doing everything in our own power, and that often shows up in forms of legalism, and, and maybe we think we're doing good things for God, but we just haven't brought God into the dis- decision. And um, So that's kind of like maybe you're rowing, and maybe you're, you're going against the source of the wind, but you think you're moving the boat in a good direction. And so what I like to say, rather than passive uh, dependence or active independence, the spiritual life is one of active dependence. And so like we actively surrender to God. We actively seek to trust him, but he is the one who gives us power. The wind, you can think of as the Holy Spirit, and, and he pushes the boat forward as it, as it fills the sail. So that's what I think it means to, to lead a life of faith. It's, it's a, always been a helpful analogy for me. So we have a role to actively surrender to God. We have a role to actively trust God. But God is the one who ultimately moves. God is the one who ultimately provides the power and the strength. Um, he does it all. We just have to be willing to let him. And so what we see in today's passage is that David strengthens himself in the Lord. He finds his strength in God. But David was responsible to surrender to God and rely on him for that strength. He had to turn to God in this moment of, of despair. The challenge for us today is the same. Are we going to continue to rely on our own strength for our own purposes? Or are we going to allow the Spirit of God to fill us with God's strength in order that we can carry out God's will and God's purposes for our lives? So, I'll go ahead and pray to close us out. God, I just uh, thank you for this passage. and I thank you for the promise and hope that um, even in our lowest moments, even in terrible situations that arise, you are still in control, you're still sovereign, and you're still working. Um, And God, that that truth should give us hope, that truth should help us to turn our eyes upon you and to find our strength in you. So God, I I pray that we would do that today, not just in our low moments, but in every, every moment of our lives, God, we would rely on your strength rather than our own. But especially in the moments of despair, um, God, we, I pray that we would find hope and realize that there's true encouragement to be had in you. I pray this in your name. Amen.